Thanks for listening to this teaching from City of Life Church. Check out www.col.tv for more great teachings, service times, and information on upcoming events. Now, let's join the service already in progress. So this story is centered around a storm. And you and I, as Floridians, we are very familiar with storms, right? Like every day at about 315, 317, you know, the apocalypse hits. <laughs> Every single day, sideways rain, you know, that's that's commonplace. Um, it, umbrellas, like, aren't even really a thing in Florida. You know, like, when you grab an umbrella, you're like, this isn't going to end well. Like, you know, it's suddenly going to reverse into an ice cream cone of rain, you know, and it's it's going to be embarrassing. Uh, it's, it's really, really crazy how quickly and unexpected a storm can hit, right? Have you ever been driving and you go under an overpass and on one side it's sunny and then on the next side it's raining? Yeah, it's like a Florida thing. If you're watching from somewhere else, you're you're just going to have to come visit. And I don't know who called us the Sunshine State. Like, every time someone comes to visit and it's like gets to the afternoon, I'm like, buckle down. (laughs) Here it comes. (laughs) But storms are pretty intense. And I have one story in particular about a storm that really stands out above the rest. We had one of those flash flood apocalyptic kind of storms where you know it's like a foot of rain in five minutes do you guys know what I'm talking about where it's just like it's it's not like it's raining it's just like the sky opened and dumped a bucket like upon us so it happened it was such a bad storm it rained so much and we were working on some kind of project. I can't remember what we were doing here at church. But uh, myself, my wife, we were working on something, and Pastor Cassie was with us. How many of y'all love Pastor Cassie Moraine? She's absolutely the best. And uh, Pastor Ca- so I grew up as an only child, and then I feel like God just set me in a family of faith. And Pastor Cassie genuinely feels like uh, my sister. There's times where it's just we laugh so much. We get to do this amazing thing called ministry together. She's an amazing leader. She leads our church staff fantastically. She leads worship amazingly. She's an amazing wife to Kyle. There's just so much uh, that I'm grateful for in Pastor Cassie's life. But we were working on something, and the rain was so bad, and Somehow she said to us, guys, I'm in trouble. My street is flooded. And I was like, oh, you know how, you know how it gets when it rains. It's like, oh, your car is like, like, you know, that kind of flooded. And she was like, no, no, there are cars stranded in the street. It is, the water is up over the hoods. I can't get to my house. And I was like, this is awesome. I want to go see. (laughs) And I was like, you know, like this, I have this bit of a hero complex. When I hear something's impossible, I'm like, not for me. You know, so I was like, Cassie, we're getting you to your house. Okay, so we had a a kind of a big SUV at the time. And so I was like, get in the car. Like, I'm going to somehow go save the day. So we're driving. And I realize as we start to get closer to her house, this is not an exaggeration. I, I see cars submerged in the water. And I don't understand how this is possible. Later, we found out that there was a serious drainage issue on the street. So all the water, none of the water was going into the drain. So it was just filling up. So there's cars abandoned. You can't even see the road. You can't see up onto the sidewalks. The sidewalks are covered in water. That's how deep this water is. So I'm driving up past the other side of the sidewalk, definitely illegal, driving up on the side because I'm getting Cassie to her house. So I'm like driving, like just going over berms, like getting as close as I can. And it gets to a moment where I cannot drive anymore. There is simply too much water. And so the hero in me, I said, Cassie, get out. We're walking. She was like, what? I said, I'm getting you to your house. And my wife was like, y'all have fun. She's like, I'll watch the car. And so we go and we're, we're walking like, this is like old school hymn status. We're wading in the water. Okay. So we're it's, and it's nighttime by the way. So we're going through this water and it starts at like mid leg and it gets up beyond our waists. Okay. At this point, My bravado is so intense. I'm just trucking. And there was a moment where we looked at each other and it was like an unspoken thing. We just like reached out hands and held hands. (laughs) And so I'm holding Pastor Cassie's hand and we're going through this water. I'm full of courage. Like we're getting you to your house. The water gets higher and higher. And then she asks a question that changes everything because she's horrified. Like she is so scared. She's like, I don't need to go home. I'm like, you're going home. And then she says, What if there's snakes in the water? (laughs) 
who thinks of that? It's, it's, yeah, literally, I, I said, like, all of my courage drained, my deep voice raised two octaves, like, what do you mean if there's snakes in the water? Like, it never occurred to me that there could be wildlife in this dark water. And not only did I start to think of snakes, I was like, what if there's gators? Like, what if there's otters? I don't know, like everything started to hit. And I started to get so scared. And we went from me holding her hand to her holding my hand. I was like, should we turn around? Do you think you can make it from here? Like I can see your house. And I got so scared. I actually did let go of her hand and watch her make it to the rest of the way. I didn't go any further. <laughs> she made it. We're fine. The county fixed the street. Now, you know, it doesn't flood like that. But that was a pretty dramatic night where I can remember in the middle of a storm suddenly becoming so afraid at the possibility of the worst case scenario. And that's kind of how the disciples are. They are chilling. They're having a great time. Ministry is going well. Life is going well. And suddenly a storm hits. Oh, I feel like I'm preaching in 2020. Suddenly a storm hits. Your business is booming. Your marriage is fine. Your kids are finally behaving. And suddenly a storm hits. Your anxiety is conquered. Your finances are okay. Everything looks good. And suddenly a storm hits. And this is the scenario the disciples find themselves in. And storms and difficulty, they bring something out of us. There are certain things that you won't learn about yourself until you're in the storm. There are certain things you won't learn until you're wading through waist deep water in the dark. Then you realize, I might be scared of snakes. <laughs> and you think, wow, Pastor Cassie really played out these scenarios. It's very scary right now. There are certain things that you cannot learn in comfort. Certain things you can't learn about your spouse in comfort. Certain things you can't learn about your kids in comfort. Certain things you can't learn about your faith in comfort. Storms bring something out of us. Difficulty brings something out of us. And here's a tough rhetorical question. What has come out of you this year? You ain't got to answer that. Because <laughs> if I answered it for myself, I'd be embarrassed up on this microphone. <laughs> What has difficulty brought out of you? Because it might have all been faith and rainbows and unicorns, but suddenly when this storm hit, you found some things in there to work on. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that there's still room to grow. We haven't arrived. Those of us that have been in church 20, 30 years, we ain't got it all together. <laughs> Because you get rocked like this and suddenly something comes up in you. Maybe anger, rage, irritability, fear, depression, doubt. It brings something different out of you. What has come out of you this year? And here's a tough pill to swallow. If something has come out of you this year that you are not proud of. Something you don't like. Something you're embarrassed of. Something that hurts. Something that hurts someone else. Here's the tough pill to swallow. The only way something comes out of you is if it's within you in the first place. The only way something is going to rise up and come out of you is if it was always in there to begin with. We like to say, oh, 2020 just made me do it. My crazy spouse just made me do it. I just, my, my, my boss and my finances, it just made me go there. No, if something is coming up and out of you, it was always there to begin with. The difficulty just happened to expose it. The trial just happened to bring it up. You could have kept cruising along in comfort with this latent issue beneath the surface, but difficulty has a way of exposing what we're carrying within us. Tough pill to swallow <laughs> because this past few months, when I had one of my most significant breakdowns, I mean, I absolutely exploded. Afterward, I, was, I had to make amends with my wife, make amends with my son, make amends with my God. I had to admit, oh wow, that was always in there. That wasn't just a fluke. It wasn't just like an oopsie daisy. You don't just get a do over. You have to repent and look inside and say, Father, this was here and I need you to help me. I need you to heal me. Difficulty brings it up and out of you. 
And again, for some context, what had these disciples just seen Jesus do? They had just watched him heal an entire town. They had just watched him preach the good news and see people flock to the edge of the water to listen to him preach from the boat. And they were being transformed and their lives were changed. And then as they're sailing to the other side, they're sailing on a high of success, of victory, and of outward results. And then the difficulty comes. Isn't it interesting how your past successes do very little for you in your present difficulties? Isn't it interesting how your past successes do very little for you in your present difficulties? That thing you worked so hard for, it doesn't do nothing for you in today's difficulty. And even though they had been in the most amazing moments just days ago in this storm they're afraid they're terrified because today's difficulty this intense storm is hitting them and they don't even know how to hold on through it now i want to give the disciples some benefit of the doubt it's not like a little storm the bible says the waves were coming over the boat would anyone else be scared too like okay some wind some lightning but when we're talking waves over the boat that's a different situation in fact, the word here in the, in the Greek for what this storm was, when it says a storm came, it's seismos, which is where we get the word seismic. It actually can also be translated as an earthquake. That's how severe that some, some Bible scholars believe that there actually was a tectonic disruption that was also causing these waves. This is like earthquake level storm. Like the absolute worst case scenario. And these waves are coming up, crashing over the boat. And remember, most of these disciples are fishermen. It takes a lot for a fisherman to get scared of a storm on a boat. Because the Sea of Galilee is notorious for quick storms. It's a little like Florida. Like they come out of nowhere, they hit, they are intense, and then they're gone. And so these guys certainly had been through storms before. It's like Floridians. You know, when, when they say a category one is coming our way. It's like, okay, so are we going to Disney or SeaWorld, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, like people in other states are like praying for you. And I was like, for what? <laughs> That's just like category one is every afternoon. <laughs> so these fishermen had a high pain tolerance for difficulty. They'd been through storms before, but this storm was different. The kind of storm that scares fishermen is a difficulty like others had never seen before. You might have been through trouble in your marriage. You might have been through trouble in your finances, trouble in your health before, but there will come moments where a seismic disruption of difficulty comes your way and it sets you on tilt as well. You might have a high pain tolerance, a high difficulty tolerance, but there always comes a moment where the difficulty and the waves start crashing over the side of the boat. We're talking two storms converging into one. You guys remember this possibility that we just came through? The, the storms in the Gulf? I remember reading a report that like this, the Fujiwara effect where two hurricanes, literally it said this, two hurricanes will meet paths and do -si do around each other, causing mass destruction. And then I saw a meme that said, who had square dancing hurricanes on their bingo card for 2020? <laughs> square dancing hurricanes. Like we're talking that kind of seismic disruption, that kind of storm. And Jesus, sleeping. Who in here is a hard sleeper? <laughs> but both of you, you're married. That's bad. You have a kid. <laughs> The, the little baby pointed to both of them. <laughs> There's a difference between being a hard sleeper and then sleeping through a seismic disruption. Waves crashing over the boat. If I were the disciples, I'd be like, Jesus, come on, man. We're getting rocked. We're taking on water. The boat is quite literally sinking. And Jesus is asleep. So they wake him up and they say, we're going to die, Jesus. We going to die. And that's the only, the only appropriate way to read that sentence. And I love this thought. When Jesus wakes up, he addresses the most urgent problem at hand, the disciples. He doesn't speak to the storm first. He speaks to the disciples first. 
if you've got problems, if you've got like three problems going on, what do you tackle first? The most urgent one. And he sees the waves, he sees the wind, and he says, I'll get to that. That's light work. That's child's play. I need to speak to what's happening in you first. Jesus is more concerned about the climate of your soul than the climate of your situation. He is going to speak first to you, then to the storm. And so often we want it the other way. We're like, God, I'm messed up. God, I'm scared. I'm going to die. Fix everything and then teach me your ways. And Jesus says, no, I'll let that storm rage because I'm more concerned with what's going on in you. Because what's happening around you is temporal, but what's happening in you has eternal consequence. And so Jesus says, let it rage. Let the storm blow. I'm speaking to my children. And he says, Oh, you of little faith, why are you so gripped with fear? He said, why are you scared? Where's your faith? He's speaking to the storm within them before he speaks to the storm around them. And I believe he's doing that today because it's easy to feel like Jesus is asleep in the storm of 2020 because man has been a long time. It's easy to feel like he's just snoozing through our difficulty, snoozing through a health scare, snoozing through political unrest, snoozing through financial crisis, snoozing through social unrest. But I believe that Jesus is speaking first to his people and soon to the storm. He's going to speak to it. He's going to silence it. But he's more concerned with what's going on in us today. And we need to start listening for what he's saying to us and Instead of looking for what he's saying to others. We've got to open our ears. We've got to listen to what he's saying to us. And this is what he says. Why are you so gripped with fear? Where is your faith? He's speaking first to us. And then he rebukes the storm. He says, now that I spoke to you, now that we took care of this situation, let me go take care of this little thing real quick. And it says he stands up and rebukes the storm. He says, hey, be still. And the waves, the Bible says, instantly stop. The wind instantly calms. And I've shared this before, but every time I get to this passage, I, ask, I, I feel God asked me this one tough question. Are the storms, the waves, the wind more obedient than you are? Because Jesus says, be still. And they say, Whew. But what happens when he says it to me? I say, oh, but, but when I see this number in the account, I'll be still. Oh, well, wait, when, when the conflict is resolved, I'll be still. When everything feels happy again, I'll be still. When everything's normal again, I'll be still. Because when Jesus speaks to storm, it stills. When Jesus speaks to me, am I obeying or not? Because stillness and peace is not a feeling. It's an act of obedience. Peace is not a byproduct of everything feeling good now. Peace is a decision to say, I hear you, and in spite of what's going on around me, I will be still. I will be at peace. I will obey. And I believe that Jesus has been issuing a command to us for quite some time, be still, be at peace. And it's time for us to obey, church. It's time for us to take our place because I know soon he's speaking to this storm. I know his character. He's done it before. He's going to do it again. Soon the waves and wind will stop around us, but he's waiting for it to stop within us first. There's no room for fear in this love. There's no room for that anxious, doubtful, uh, rage-filled approach to life. We've got to be still. Let's be obedient and then, like I said, he rebukes the storm. Uh, again, the word here in Greek is so important. It, it actually changes some of the entire meaning of the story. The word for rebuke here is the exact word that's used anytime Jesus casts out a demon. It is a spiritual, uh, like attacking, offensive kind of word. It's like cast out. He casts out the storm. He rebukes the storm. It doesn't mean he just yelled at it. It doesn't just mean he used a big voice. It is a spiritually significant word. In fact, in a moment after this story, he's going to get to the other side of the lake and he's going to meet some demon-possessed people and he's going to rebuke those demons. 
And if we miss the meaning of where this story happens and what he's about to go do, then we overlook the significance of the storm. If you think it's just a coincidental storm, you're missing the point of the story. If you think it's a storm that has no meaning behind it, you're missing the point of the story. Because Jesus did not address it meteorologically. He didn't address it coincidentally. He stood up and spoke spiritually against the spiritual attack that was behind the storm. He rebuked it the same way he rebuked demons. And as readers, we have to understand the storm was an attack. It was spiritual. Friends, I'm not the guy to try to assign spiritual meaning to every little thing in life, but if we are blind to the fact that what we're living in today is an attack, then we are going to miss the meaning of it. We're going to fight it the wrong ways. We're going to fight it the wrong ways. We're going to try to be logical. We're going to try to be factual. We're going to try to be strategic when we need to be spiritual and take a stance of warfare, not against people, not against the people around us, not against culture, but against the prince of the power of the air who would try nothing more than to disrupt the purposes of God. Let's talk strategy for a second. The Messiah and All of the men who would continue to spread the kingdom of God through the earth are in one boat together. If you were the devil, what would you do? Let's take that thing down. If I can eliminate this one boat, I have stopped the advancement of the kingdom of God. If I can hit them where it hurts, If I can sink this ship, then I have won the battle. And if you think the enemy is not strategically looking to hit you where it hurts, then you're missing the point of this battle. No, he's not going to hit you where it's comfortable. He's going straight for the throat, straight for your marriage, straight for your kids, straight for your finances, straight for your faith, whatever that issue is. Because if he can sink that ship, he knows that he's going to stop the purpose at hand. Oh, I'm calling him out. And I I take personal offense that he tried to take a swing at the church globally in 2020. The enemy would love nothing more than to dismantle churches across the globe. And he has launched an outright attack against the gathering of believers together forever. But we are going to rise above. I don't care if it's through cameras, through cell phones, through connection. This weapon will not prosper. The enemy will not succeed. And what the enemy intended for evil, God will use for good. He will use it for good. But I'm going to say it at risk of sounding old and churchy. It's an attack, friends. And if we don't acknowledge it, then we will never fight back. It's an attack. An attack on our faith. An attack on the peace that is within us. And Jesus rebukes this storm. Casts it out. And why? Why would the attack happen? Well, I don't have time to read what happens next, but let me tell you where they were headed. They were headed for a region called the Gadarenes. And when they reached this region, they met two men who were possessed by so many demons. They lived in a graveyard and everyone in the surrounding area was so horrified of these men. These men would gnash their teeth and rip their own flesh. And the people around them were superstitiously afraid to the point where these men and the the power of darkness that operated in them ruled the region. It's what we would call a principality, a stronghold, a grip of the enemy over an entire region. And Jesus, remember earlier before the story said, let's go over there. Oh, I love Jesus. He said, let's go over there. And the disciples had no idea what they're in for. And Jesus said, let's go into the dark. Let's go into the night. Let's go right over there into that stronghold because I'm ready to tear some stuff down. I'm ready to do some work. And the enemy, he ain't stupid. He sees the boat and he says, huh, they're getting kind of close to my turf. Huh, they're getting kind of close to the area where I have a grip of fear over an entire region. They're getting really close to the two guys that I have used to instill fear in people. They're headed straight for it. And Jesus doesn't relent. He says, let's go, let's go, let's go. And so the enemy launches an outright attack against the boat. 
I believe the enemy will always send a storm to stop the attack of heaven against the kingdom of hell. He'll always send a storm to stop what heaven is pushing against. And so with this storm, it just makes me wonder how close are we getting to seeing a victory. If he's launching all this attack, we must be walking right into his turf. We must be walking right into the stronghold, right into the principality. I speak this prophetically. I believe the church is on the cusp of answering some of the most important questions we've ever had to answer, and it is going to push forward the kingdom of God. How do we love people who don't look like us or talk like us or act like us? I believe the church is figuring it out. How do we embrace people who we've never been able to embrace before? The church is figuring it out. How can black and white and brown all live together in peace? I believe we're figuring that out together. I believe that we're answering these questions, and the enemy knows that when we step into that territory, there will be victory. So of course he's trying to dismantle us and he's trying to dismantle you. But I believe that there is purpose to what's happening here. They keep sailing. They keep going. And yes, we're in a storm. And yes, it's spiritual and it's dividing people and it's shaking people and it's scaring people. But we're going to stay the path. We're going to stay the course. We're not turning around. We're going to keep going. We have to. We have to. Friends, we can't give up. If you're watching right now, we can't give up. We've already sailed this far. In fact, it might be more dangerous to go back where we came from. We are already, as they say in poker, pot committed. You've already put the chips in the middle of the table. You have already said yes to Jesus this much. You've got to keep saying yes now. It's time for us to make the decision to stay the course to stay the course. Staying sometimes is harder than straying. I was in a conversation last week with someone who was talking about how many people just kind of like stray off the path and just leave. And guys, I'm not saying I've got it perfect, but if there's one thing I've learned, it's just to how like hold on and stay and stay and stay and stay. And I'm not letting go. And I might get a thousand things wrong, but you're going to see me planted in the house of God. I'm not letting go. I'm not giving up. I'll have tears running down my face. I'll be filled with all kinds of emotion, but I'm staying. I'm staying. Because straying is going to cost me more than I'll ever understand. We've got to stay the course. So yes, later they go to the Gadarenes. They cast out these demons. The whole region is transformed. But before we kind of close this out, I want to back up for a moment. Because I've preached this passage before, and there's a lot here. But there's one dynamic to this that I had a revelation about recently. One part that stands out above the rest, an overlooked part when it comes to Jesus. What was his posture in the storm? He was asleep. (laughs) And it's almost comical, right? Like you think of it from the disciples' perspective. (laughs) Like, Jesus, why are you asleep? But Jesus was asleep in the storm. He was at peace in the storm. And remember earlier, the tough pill to swallow is that the storm will bring out whatever is in you. For the disciples, it brought out the fear that was already in them. The the doubt, the worry. But Jesus, prior to the storm, was filled with peace. And look what the storm did. It brought peace out of him. This is deep stuff. Oh, we're, we're just getting to it. We're just getting to it. See, the way that Jesus went into the storm determines who Jesus is in the storm. See, when you're in the middle of the storm, you don't have time to get ready. You need to go into the storm already ready. Jesus went in with peace, and then the storm brought out what was in him. The the weapon the enemy intended for evil, God used to bring good. See, this storm was meant to annihilate the disciples, but actually it's the very thing that unleashed the peace that was within Jesus. And when, he might have just kept sleeping if the storm didn't come. He might have just stayed asleep if the storm didn't happen. But because the difficulty came, Jesus stood up and it unleashed the peace of God over that situation and it brought about a miracle. Without getting too technical, I just, I had to, I dove into really looking at barometric pressure, like how storms happen, how wind happens, how how this kind of situation would would happen. And it's an area of low atmospheric pressure. 
That low pressure is where that really bad weather happens. And then the way it all kind of levels out is that high pressure swirls toward it, and there's always going to aim to be a balance. That's just how it works. And so that's why the wind swirls. It's trying to balance out that pressure. And so if we were to look at this scientifically, obviously there's a spiritual leap here, but the storm was this area of low pressure, but within Jesus was a high pressure of peace. And when he stood up, it rushed out of him and went to balance out the inconsistency in the situation around him. See, in the disciples, it was low pressure matching low pressure. The storm is going to keep raging on. But when low pressure meets high pressure, the storm ceases, the wind stops, the waves end, and we have to be people that carry that high pressure of peace within us. And when we walk into a situation, we stand up and we unleash the peace. We let it go. We let what is within us speed begin to be released around us you can't go into the storm and then try to get ready you need to be ready and maybe you weren't ready for this storm but what storms are ahead of us that we need to prepare for now you got to figure it out friend you've got to figure it out because here's what I want to say to you the only way that we will see peace around us is if we first see it within us The only way we will see love around us is if it's first within us. The only way we will see goodness around us is if it's first within us. And if you are wanting to see the climate and the culture and the circumstances around you look a different way, then we have got to unleash the peace that is within us. You're never gonna be able to release something that you don't first have. And so it starts with you. It starts with me taking responsibility for the climate of our souls so that we can release, unleash that peace into the world. If you're waiting for it to happen around you, you've missed how it works because this is how change happens. It happens in you, through you, and then around you. Change happens in you, through you, and then around you. So yes, I believe Jesus is about to speak to this storm. I believe we're gonna see his name victorious in 2020. Not in 2021, in 2020. We're gonna see the storm spoken to and it's going to obey. I'm actually not worried about that. I know he's gonna do it, but he's first speaking to his children. He's first speaking to us. And you cannot allow the storm around you to cause a storm within you today make a decision to let the peace of God rule and reign in your heart. And then when the wind blows, unleash the peace. Let the power and pressure of peace within you rush toward the low areas around you and watch it balance out. Watch it balance out in your marriage. Watch it balance out in your home. Watch it balance out in your health. Watch it balance out in your finances. Watch it balance out in your community. Watch it balance out. There is no way that the peace of God will lose the battle against the troubles of the world. It wins 10 out of 10. And I know behind this storm, there is ground we're gonna claim. The church is gonna be victorious after this. We're tearing down strongholds. So let's stay that course and unleash the peace of God in our lives. This concludes the teaching. If you'd like to support what God is doing here at City of Life, click on the Give button at www.col.tv or text a dollar amount to the number 855-997-6900. We hope you'll join us again.